class and low income households and among black residents. So Professor Mitchell earlier described in the plenary that black households are far less likely to have a will and we're seeing the impacts of that in Philadelphia. And I also want to point out that by and large, we're talking about thousand square foot parcels in Philadelphia. So not acres and acres um, in, in rural, like it's in rural areas in the country. So subdivision is just not an option. So these are properties that a person is living in and in order to, to, to move forward, you really do have to kind of go through this process of deciding who's going to have the home or whether or not it's going to go through a sale. So we estimate that about um, 10,000 properties in Philadelphia are dealing with this issue. We got that number using the city's administrative data sets um, to compare the names on property deeds with recent death records. Um, Philadelphia is fortunate in that we have fairly comprehensive parcel and record, I mean, parcel and ownership data. Um, I kind of want to show you guys a map of where these properties are located. I think that that is teed up in the slides there. Um, but what you'll see whenever that does come up is that tangled titles in the city are most prevalent in the parts of the city um, where significant portions of the city's black residents reside. These are also areas with high rates of poverty. Um, these are so and so in Philadelphia, in order to clear title, typ a typical probate fee is about four hundred dollars a month, um, or not a month, excuse me, four hundred dollars to clear it but households don't really have that amount of money um, sitting to be able to clear title, and particularly for those places where, um, where incomes are low, where people are dealing with poverty, the ability to, to come up with the funds to, um, to clear those titles is challenging. It looks like um, we gotta go back a slide there. Oh, it disappeared. Are we bringing it back or no? I can keep going if it's not working out. Yes, we're bringing it back. Just one okay. moment. Okay. There we go. Okay. So it's a funky, um, complicated map there. <laughs> but what it's showing is on the city of Philadelphia, and um, the blue dots are showing instances of tangled title within the city of Philadelphia. Bigger dots mean that there are more tangles. Um, smaller dots mean that there are fewer. Um, and so where you see those large dots in Upper North Philadelphia, North Philadelphia, and West Philadelphia, those are places where um, poverty is high, and there are traditionally African American neighborhoods in the city. You also have a, a fair amount of tangled titles um, in South Philly, and that's a, an area of the city that um, has a lot of African Americans, but a lot of other um, um, races are living in that part of the city. Um, I'm trying to see if I want to draw your attention also to this table to the side here. It's showing the median property value of those properties that are um, that have tangled tangled titles. So North Philadelphia, as I mentioned, has the highest proportion of tangled titles in the city. And the median value there is $40,000. And so these are properties that have been, you know, deemed or that really have, uh, have over time not been seen as having high value. So one of the things that we found is that many households don't realize that they have a title issue. Um, they find out that they have this issue when would-be homeowners apply for supports for things such as basic systems repair or adaptive modification for seniors, programs that come through um, the city through CDBG, CDBG funds that are federal or even local grants. Um, they apply for these programs and they're rejected. Um, and we all know that without your name on the deed, households can't get a loan for repair or refinancing to take out or to take out cash for renovation or even for higher education expenses. So these properties fall into disrepair and the households that are living them in them are not able to access or transfer the wealth that has the, the wealth that has built when the wealth has built in those homes to pass it to their heirs. Um, one of the things that was really striking to us is um, our city's code enforcement office shared with us that many of the properties that have tangled titles have visible holes in their roofs. So you can see them from aerial photography and you see that these are properties where there is a need for property maintenance, but it just isn't happening because they don't, because households don't have the personal wealth to, to take care of the, the repairs and also they don't have access to the other sources of funds. A really striking antidote that we learned during the research is that the lion's share of recent property collapses that's a thing in philadelphia not a tremendous not it's not that frequent but when it happens it's devastating um 
and those properties, the lion's share of them have been properties with tangled titles. Um, so you're talking about a loss of property, um, a loss of life, and also a loss of, you know, quality of life in, in a neighborhood because you're impacting neighbors where homes are row houses and often connected in Philadelphia. So as I pointed out before um, in the table accompanying the map, um, the median home prices in the areas with the highest proportions of tangled titles are low. So $40,000 for a house in North Philadelphia. Um, and what we found is that homes in Philadelphia where there is no mortgage or those where there's a tangled title are a really important source of affordable housing in the city. So if you don't have to pay a mortgage cost, then automatically you're spending a lot less money on your housing. And so this is something that we're interested in preserving just as or, as our city is and we're really interested in preserving affordability. But the changes in some of these neighborhoods poses an incentive and opportunity for heirs who are looking to clear title. Um, obviously all of the challenges for clearing title still exist, but there is um, a shift from potentially a property that was worth $40,000 to now being worth you know, $200,000 because of changing neighborhood conditions. But um, as property values and demand rise, there's also external pressure from developers and potential for deed theft, which is something that we've been seeing a lot in Philadelphia and a, is a major concern. It kind of wraps me up. I, I hope I didn't talk too fast in going through, but I wanted to make sure there was enough time for, for others to, to talk. No, that, no, that was great. Um, you said a couple of things that kind of um, jumped out at me. You kind of danced around this a little bit, but you talk about like changing neighborhood, neighborhood sort of changing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that, you know, uh, brings to mind for me the big, the big G word, gentrification. So can you talk a little bit more about how uh, gentrification may be creeping or already existing in some of these places where you ha have these tangled titles in Philly? Sure. Philadelphia, um, for a long time, was a city where, where not much was happening. There wasn't a lot of um, development. It was really um, kind of dormant in terms of the market. And over the past couple of decades, we've seen quite a bit of new development. Um, and, and while those areas don't overlap direct, directly with the places where you see the large um, blue circles, it's adjacent. So um, kind of towards the bottom in the middle of the map, you see Center City, Philadelphia, and that's where our central business district is, and that's where our expensive, most expensive housing is. If you look, look a little bit north of that line, that dark line bordering Center City, you see North Philadelphia, and that is um, a place that has been traditionally African-American, traditionally, um, or not traditionally, but for decades, um, having long-term um, disinvestment. And so that has changed quite a bit. Um, what we also see, though, is that the number of tangled titles in those areas have gone down. Um, with the data that we have, it's hard to know whether the tangles were cleared as a, as a result of de development pressure, whether heirs were, were actually able to, um, to benefit from changes in their community, or if they were cleared through, through other means. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Um, I have, you know, lots of questions pop up in my mind, but yeah. I need to be cognizant that we need to move on because mm -hmm. I want to give um, certainly folks. We do have a question uh, in the chat. Well, we actually, we would like to hold the questions to the end. So we, because we want to okay. make sure that everybody, yeah, that everybody has um, a, a chance uh, to are uh, able to take uh, full, uh, make full use of their time. So, um, the next person I'd like to introduce or to uh, ask to speak is Betsy Taylor. Uh, Betsy came on a little bit late, um, so she didn't hear the order that I introduced the panel in, but I hope she's ready to speak. Could you please unmute yourself, Betsy? Thank you so much, Cassandra, and I'm so sorry I had connection problems, but I'm thrilled to be part of this and I'm learning so very much. Um, I'm going to be speaking about the uh, historic coal counties of Central Appalachia. So that's the mountainous parts of Ohio, Virginia, West Virginia, Kentucky, and Tennessee. And this is a powerful place from which to look at the intersection of race and place. I mean, it's an area that's stereotyped as being white, um, but it, for much of the 20th century, uh, had a rich mix of, of races and ethnicities because of the, the coal industry. So, Brett, if you could line up my presentation. I pulled, together, <laughs> I pulled together way too many slides here, so I'm sorry if it's a little dizzying, but it will give you um, in, the, in the 
recordings a chance to, to look at some of the background information. Um, so I'm going to start with looking at the household level very briefly and then doing a bit of a macro structural picture um, and then looking at the, at this, this, the situation at, as a position from which to look to the future to talk about how um, land reform can be part of really building a new kind of more just uh, post-coal economy. Um, so, um, yeah, thank you so much, Brett, for doing that. Um, the, it, if, if we, um, and you can move to the, the next slide. Um, the big, the, our first challenge that we face is that it's, uh, we don't really know exactly um, how much heirs property there is in, uh, in central Appalachia um, because it's, um, because it, 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 there's been a lack of research on, on the topic. Um, we have two rigorous studies. Um, well, two scholars have been doing really excellent work. Brady Deaton did a randomized study of households in one Eastern Kentucky County. And he found that about a quarter of the households there, the, the families reported that they had um, heirs property. Um, and then Cassandra Johnson Gaither has been at the forefront of using big data to, um, to, to, to try and uh, pull out possible and probable heirs property um, in, in, in that area. And so hopefully we will soon, we're starting some research projects and I'm really trying to push Appalachian studies to, to do more, more work. Uh, next slide, please. Um, but, um, it, 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 and next slide. Um, but it, it does appear anecdotally that there is a lot of heirs property and it cuts across all r races in central Appalachia. And just looking at where it, it clusters, um, it, it is, it does also cluster in the same areas where there is a really entrenched intergenerational um, household vulnerability. Next slide, please. Um, so if we try to understand this situation, it's very important to look at the, uh, be very aware of the fact that this is an area where you have sort of multiple layers of land regimes. Um, and this goes way back in this area, in, in, in this region, because Appalachia was, before we had a Wall Street where middle class and upper class folks on the East Coast could invest, Appalachia Speculating in land in Appalachia was where people um, put their investment. And so uh, starting in the, you know, after the very brutal genocide um, from the beginning of, of our country, um, the absentee land companies were speculating in this area. And this pattern continued right up to the end of the 19th century when um, the, the, there was a frenzy of, of um, investment because of the emerging coal and timber industries. Um, and this, um, this pattern means that you have most of the land in this area actually still owned by some of these companies are really old and, and often they are the basis of the old money of um, East Coast cities. Um, and then the commodity producers, the coal companies, the timber companies are often leasing. So when you're thinking about just transition, you're talking about a situation with many players and very complicated regimes. Um, and I, I might not have, it, it, it gets pretty complicated um, now it, it, when the coal industry is collapsing and you have bankruptcies, companies that are essentially sort of the, the walking dead in terms of um, their viability as firms. Um, but they, um, those companies are, um, um, the, 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 much of the actual land is, is held by players behind the companies that are leasing it. Next, next slide, please. Um, but, it, part of the, the situation is that you have these structural patterns of boom and bust, but also very, very creative community responses 
um, in which people really depended, because of the instability of wage labor, they depended on subsistence activities and used the corporate land and the public lands as a kind of forest commons. So now when we look to the future, we find that there is, there are vulnerable but widespread practices of traditional forest farming and, and a passionate attachment to the land, despite all the dislocations. Next slide, please. Um, an example of this is um, my coworker, Ruby Daniels, who's community engagement coordinator for Lycan, um, who started an herbal farm on uh, Ayers property land that she has very creatively used as a site to carry on multi-generational Afrolatian traditions of herbalism and forest farming. Um, and, uh, and, and this is in an area, next slide please, where we have, I mean, if, if now that we are really building movements for a just transition that use an asset-based, um, community-based model for transition, one of the great assets we have in this area is this extraordinarily, extraordinarily uh, biodiverse ancient forest of central Appalachia. Um, and so next slide, please. So, um, and, and, and there, there, are, there are many other examples throughout the region. Next slide, please. So can you kind um, of wrap it up? I want to make sure that we get everybody in here. Okay. Um, and uh, just quickly, I, we had, a, in the late 1970s, um, there was a major community-based, very participatory study involving hundreds of volunteers of folks who uh, studied land ownership, and it was, you know, local folks going into the county courthouses and, and gathering the data, data. Next slide, please. And it, this, in, in this study, the Appalachian Land Study, identified that th this was the first time that we really had a compelling picture of the extent of absentee ownerships. Almost 75, about three quarters of the land is, is absentee owned. And that uh, along with that, because of the power imbalances, um, that it's a situation where uh, there are very few public revenues coming to the local communities. So um, this is, the, out of the terrible um, uh, uh, dislocations and, and economic struggles of this region, we also we are in a time when there is a, a vibrant um, um, movement for just transition and people doing some very ex ex I think exciting um, reimagining of what might be possible in terms of land ownership, and it looks like. Um, heirs property can be an important part of that because there's a possibility that a high proportion of the land that's private owned in this area, locally owned by residents, is heirs property. And, and I, I, people are eager to listen to experiences in other regions about um, what, what's possible in terms of new structures of land ownership now that the um there is there the, with the decline of the, the current um extractive industries that have so dominated the region okay thanks so much betsy okay so tony hello hi can you can you hear me I just want to make sure before I get started. Okay, great. Um, I know we are running out of time and I want to leave room for everyone to be able to ask questions. So I'm just going to go through a quick history. Um, to begin with, Tilhasis Quinshut and Sutitqua. Hello, my name is Water Runs Downhill and my English name is Tony Stanger McLaughlin and I work with the Native American Agriculture Fund and I'm in, here in place of our CEO, Janie Hip. Many of you know her. She's been very active in agriculture across all sectors for many years. She sends her regards. 
Now to jump into this really, really sad story, which is the history of American Indians land loss. As you can see on the map that I have up, you can see from 1784 until present, the land loss that American Indians have experienced. Now, two of the things from the plenary, two points that I want to, that I think what are very important to bring over, and one is that this is not a historical issue. We are dealing with this, our current generations are dealing with these issues right now. My children will have to deal with these issues. They're not going to go any away anytime soon, and unfortunately, some of the ways that other communities have been able to start to remedy issues will not work in Indian communities because we will never own our land. The federal government owns our land and holds our land in trust. That's one of the main ways that American Indians have their land and it, it's through a trust agreement where the government has that in place in trust and the individuals are the tribal governments have the use of it and and to go back to a 101 um, some some people have maybe just moved here from another country American Indians are individuals that are aboriginal indigenous to this land here in North America and parts of South America and we have our own governments, governing systems. Uh, there are hundreds of tribes throughout the country. We are located within states and we are, our, govern, our governing systems are equal to states. We have, we, uh, the states and the federal government, the states are on one level and the federal government is, uh, supersedes us. So just to give you a, a little bit of understanding about what a tribal government is. Now back to the land issue. American Indians have been dealing with fractionalization uh, since colonization. <laughs> Traditionally, our lands were held communally. Uh, depending on where your tribe was from, you were nomadic. My tribe, I'm from Eastern Washington, from the Colville tribe, and we would, my tribe were, would go from Canada all the way down to California during seasonal time changes. Today, it looks much different. There are reservations throughout the country, some as small as it w smaller than an acre, other reservations that are held by the tribal governments, the largest being the Navajo Nation, which has over 30 million acres and encompasses four different states. The, ish the main issues that we have are, uh, like, what, like it was discussed earlier, uh, have been affected by federal by the federal government and by different acts of Congress and different Supreme Court cases. Um, one of the main most destructive ones being the Dawes Act, the General Allotment Act, and most of these acts were done so in a manner to civilize the Indian, to to get rid of the their traditional cultural attachments to the land and make them citizens, to make Native Americans farmers, and a, a number of destructive policies were put in place to enact this, and, and again, still within my generation is, is at the tail end of some of those uh, acts. And now moving forward, we are, we are trying to get rid of those fractionization issues. And one so couple of the later acts that were put into place to remedy some of the harm done prior were land consolidation and the land consolidation has assisted tribes. There's been a Supreme Court case that helped spur this, a couple, but uh, one being that a land buyback program was conducted by the Bureau of Indian Affairs and within the Department of Interior, where if, you're, if you had such a small percentage within a, a communal land ownership that you could, uh, you could, but they could buy that land from you. You could sell it to the tribe or, and the tribe would hold it collectively. So another major issue that tribes have is that when they lose, when allotments, because there's individual allotments that each individual person was given uh, during the allotment, during the Dawes Act and these allotments, some people still have their allotments today and they've held them, but initially the federal government would hold those allotments in trust for up to 25 years or later the Burke Act was imposed to let people, uh, those that wanted to, uh, could petition to have their 
the trust status removed so they could use their land more effectively. Um, but mostly that was done so, so that more land could be taken in land that they called surplus that wasn't necessarily surplus or non-use. Anyway, I've got four minutes, so I'm going to push right through. The, the allotments that we have today, you think 100 years almost has gone by, and how many generations have then started to access this land through airship. And oftentimes, depending on what tribe you're from, just to talk about death or, or talk about a will is very taboo. In, and like I said, are one of our largest reservations in the United States, the Navajo Nation, you don't talk about death. So uh, probate planning is not something that is included. It's, it's very, in, in some places you can't talk about it at all. Um, so that adds another layer that, to the issues that tribes face when they're trying to use their land to get rid of this factionization issue. But the combination of the Indian Land Buyback Program and also some positive uh, issues within the farm bill to reduce fractionalization as long as the, the land is used for agricultural purposes has, has alleviated some of these issues, but they're never going to go away. And one of the other issues that we see in Indian country is that even if the tribe owns the land, uh, and a majority of it's leased out to non-natives for production purposes, and this is done so for an another reasons, is because tribes and individuals don't own their land and it's held in trust, it's hard for them to enter programs within the federal government like the USDA. So the three main ways that you can get a farm number tr don't, don't parlay into Indian country because oftentimes Native American farmers don't file taxes. They don't have to if they're operating in certain confines within the reservation, wholly, wholly within the reservation. So they're not filing a tax, they don't have a Schedule F, they don't own their land, so they can't show a deed. Uh, so for tribes to retain that number to enter some of these programs or to even in, enter some of the disaster assistance programs, they can't use. So oftentimes they'll lease their land. An example given by an organization that has done a lot of work to help improve Indian land issues is the Indian Land um, Tenure Foundation. They have an example on the Pine Ridge Reservation where in one year, nearly uh, $33 million was extrapolated from the reservation. And uh, only a, only 20 of all of that, of all the farmers that were receiving the benefit of that land, there was only 20 Native Americans that were operating and they weren't receiving nearly that. I have another example. When I was doing work on a Nesperus reservation in Idaho, I surveyed a county and within that county of all the producers that said that they make over 100,000 within the former fiscal year, only one identified as Native American. So billions of dollars of throughout the United States is going to non-natives that are utilizing Native American land. And it's not to say that that relationship can't be beneficial because we also have constraints on our water, uh, how we use our water. In, in Indian country, we have two main uh, acts, uh, our doctrines that we abide by as depending on where you're at within the United States. And one of them being that you have to, you have use it or lose it. And so often if the Native American tribal members or the tribe as a whole aren't going to use the land, then they, they allow non-Natives to use that land and they count that irrigation, that irrigable land towards their use so they don't lose it. Um, so there's, it's, convoluted, there's many issues, but one thing I wanted to highlight that crosses the rural boundary, because often Indian country, our reservations are in rural communities, is that when you're an, a Native American or a first-time home buyer, person, a minority person, and you're getting a federally backed loan, like a FHA loan, uh, for tribes they have what's called a 184D loan, you can use that in some areas in the entire state, but you can't you then cannot use that like a, a traditional mortgage where you can use the value within your home or your property. Um, that's another thing that, that we deal with is, is that as, as we're trying to utilize land as an economic driver, which oftentimes the foundation of wealth, there's my timer, we can't do that with those, those guaranteed backed loans, those FHA loans, and for, for many, it's a time that we start to look outside of those loans 
to create organizations and nonprofits and collectively pooling money together for reservations for um, Native Americans living in urban communities so that we have more assistance for first time buyers so that then their next generation can use that property or that land, that home and the value within it to continue to pass down wealth. But again, the Indian Land Tenure Foundation is a great resource. They also, uh, they do a lot of work for the American Indian Probate Reform Act, where we're trying to get more Native Americans to participate in, in thinking beyond their lifetime and by preparing wills. So that's what I have for today, and uh, we're open for questions. Right. Thank you so much, Tony. That was excellent. There was one question in the chat, and I think it was directed to Octavia, and I Looks like she kind of addressed that question. So, hope, so let's just sort of go on from there and just open it up to folks that are uh, attending. You know, if you have a question, please pose it to the panelists. I believe there may have been a, a Cassandra, another question possibly. Okay. Um, it, it looks like it may have been from Timothy about multiplying the number of tangled can we multiply the number of tangled properties by the median market value? Shouldn't that give us a picture? And I think this may have been directed to Octavia, this question also. It, it was actually a, in response to a question that somebody ans, uh, asked okay. on the chat. Uh, can I, should we put our questions in on the chat or can we speak? You can speak. Say, Tony, um, uh, can you talk, uh, uh, and you may have already, uh, but can you talk a bit about sovereignty uh, and, uh, and uh, federal government or private uh, efforts to um, secure um, equity uh, with regard to lending? So, you know, a bank is reluctant to, to lend in, on, a, on a reservation if they can't secure the asset, which if it's held in trust is complicated. So tribes establish uniform commercial codes to do so, but then there are issues of sovereignty as a, as a result. Could you just talk a little bit about, you know, the importance of sovereignty and how, and how what seems like a, a solution may not necessarily uh, be, be one for the tribe? Well, as I said at the beginning of my presentation, state governments and tribal governments are equal and they are they fall underneath the federal government. So just like you can't state governments can't be sued, tribal governments can't be sued. But tribes can offer limited waivers of sovereign immunity, and some tribes do, some tribes don't. But there's also some alternative methods in the structuring of different tribal business enterprises, such as Section 17 corporations. Tribes are creating their own codes, their own commercial codes, their own laws. So oftentimes when we're talking about statutes for a state, the similar the thing you would see within a tribe is a code. Um, but we're strengthening our codes, our, our own laws, each different tribe, so that more outside entities, more lenders will be interested and feel more secure in, in, in the event that they do have to do what's called exhaustion. Often tribes, when they limit their waiver, their uh, immunity, they do so under the guise that you're going to first you're first going to go to our tribe through our tribal court systems before we then go to some outside jurisdiction. But as, as scary as that might seem for some, almost every tribal government uh, today, majority of them have their own tribal court. Many of their judges are, are duly, uh, they, they are are licensed in the state. They're also licensed in the tribal court. Oftentimes they're, they're licensed in district courts or the Supreme Court because a lot of tribal cases go to federal, um, to the, our federal court, our circuit court systems, but it's not a scary place to be. And, and oftentimes tribes can also agree to different types of mediation, but tribes do have the authority to waive that should they want to. But also um, you, you talked about uh, kind of leveraging that tribes don't have the ability to, um, what they need outside investors because they, they can't, 
they're, they're non-taxable entities for one, um, but also because they don't own their land, they can't um, use it in the way that a non-native non would use it. And one example is that for a farmer, you can use the value of your land or you can use the value of whatever you're producing on that land. And generally you can't do that in any country, but in the last two farm bills and within the department, many changes have been made to encourage the use of, of Indian land by being creative on what they can use. Um, I see Patrice Kunish is on, on with us too, and she's an amazing scholar in this area, but tribes also have their own banking systems now. They have their own CDFIs. There's tribal community financial institutions, so they can use those for lending. Um, but oftentimes in order to get lending from it, a um, one you know conventional private bank it does cost you do need a limited waiver of sovereign immunity but again you look at big construction projects you look at some of these large um, casinos or infrastructure development that takes place on reservations and it takes place through those limited waivers of sovereign immunity which also brings us to there's partnerships in rural America on and off the reservation in the most rural parts of America, you will often find a reservation and they are the cornerstone of that rural community. Uh, all of on, on, on and off the reservation, oftentimes they supply the healthcare facility, they supply the police force and that is on and off the reservation. Often those are cross deputized or our Indian health clinics are 638 con clinics where non-natives can use those. So um, it's, it's not, when I'm talking about Native Americans, I'm talking about rural America and, and collectively how we can work together. Yeah, it's just stunningly complicated. Um, at any rate, so thank you. Thank you. All right, so we're, we're almost at the, um, we have like a minute left. Are there any other questions? May I ask a question? <laughs> oh, it, um, we, the okay. next, oh, sorry, I gotta put my, uh, five, so, we have a little bit of wiggle room here, so please ask a question if you've been wanting to. Okay, um, um, Tani, I wanted to know um, any of our National Institute of Food and Agriculture programs, have they been of any assistance for you for our extension outreach, um, education outreach, and um, helping with the uh, building uh, farmer um, schools on the land? Have they helped you at all? I don't have it like an exact number or statistic, but I know that we're in the middle of what we hope will be a reform in our, our extension for Indian, for reservations. And, and through those extension programs, many tribes rely heavily on the services that can be provided in the training, in the lay advocacy, in the filling out of applications and forms. Um, it's, it's very important and I hope that partnership can grow, but one of the impediments that we find, it again needs a congressional fix and it needs an updated budget. Um, the budget has been static for extension across the board, but especially for, for Indian country. Um, and we hope that that level can be increased because we don't want our Indian country projects in extension to compete against each other. We want them to be able to communicate and be partnership be partners in expanding and expanding and the way that the extension program is built right now is you you hold your information because you don't want the next person to be able to get it and then if they get it it could mean that you're funding then you don't get funded that year or, or the next year but some of the resources that our land grants offer um, in extension to tribes that they don't get elsewhere is sur survey soil surveys um, water studies, GIS, things that tribes often don't have or tribal colleges don't have, but our land grant institutions that have uh, reservation extension can offer to those communities, but also through our nonprofit partners. Okay, can you, um, I guess I can send you a chat or I can get your information. Um, so I can, it's one of the programs I support and I wanna make sure that we're doing the right thing. That's wonderful. And so the Native American, I didn't say this at the beginning, I should have, the Native American Agriculture Fund is a private philanthropic trust. We mm -hmm. give out funding and we dedicated a large pool of our funding this last two years to extension. Um, but the, the most recent funding that we gave out was for nonprofits or, or any of our eligible entities to come in and try to help us solve this issue with extension. 
But if you know of any Native American farmers or ranchers, nonprofits, you yourselves working for various organizations can be fiscal sponsors for Native American projects or for projects that serve Native American farmers and ranchers. You can apply to our funding. We're a philanthropic drawdown trust and we will exist. We have 18 more years of funding to give out. We're a 20 year um, fund. And the first year we gave out 10 million, this year we gave out 15 million. Okay. Awesome, thanks so much for the, the question. So I think we need to formally end this session because we have to do another one at um, 4.45, but the chat room I was told is it remains open. So if people just wanna kind of ask some questions informally, that's totally cool. Is that the case, Brett? That's what I was told. Can't hear you, you're muted. Thank you, yes. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, so this is going to be open because we're, we're, we're staying on, obviously, because the next one starts in a few minutes to 445. Um, also, if anyone has questions after the fact, if you want to email them to me, I'm putting my email in the chat. I can certainly address those questions to any of the panelists. Um, and, you know, and, and if they would like to, to connect you to for any further work. Okay, I'd like to thank all of our speakers. It's been really good to have these discussions. Thank you so much. And thanks for everybody for showing up and posing questions. And keep talking if you want to. I, I have a question. Uh, first of all, I wanna thank all the, all the panelists. And I think this question is probably directed to Miss um, Taylor and Miss Stenger. Um, it's, it's, it, I guess I would like your uh, thoughts on what seems to me as someone who's you know, not really educated in this area, that there's a tension between like what's culturally and traditionally appropriate with what is like legally uh, allowable and kind of like how, just like the, the tension between like collectively owned land and individually owned land, um, in Appalachia as well as uh, Indian country. And I guess, would ye, either or both of you say that like to make it like work, you have to sort of engage in like the Western way of doing things? Uh, or are there, is there like other active efforts to make the traditional system work currently? I'll go ahead and talk about Indian country first. Uh, we have a spiritual connection to our land that will never cease to exist. And even during removal, we have tribes that were removed from the East Coast to uh, Western territories. They still have their uh, spiritual connections to that land back east. That's why often within the forest service, you will notice in the forest plan, the forest management plans, different tribes being mentioned or certain tribes have treaty rights to these uh, old former uh, territories that they had. And that's one thing that is unique um, and, and other parts of, of different communities and minorities have this issue, but for Indian country especially, we'll never leave our land even though a majority of the Superfund sites in the United States are located on reservations, we're still not going to leave. Um, our water contamination, lack of water, any of those issues, it's because we have this connection to the land. Oftentimes in our creation stories, the creator at one point gave us this specific land that we are to be stewards of from here on out. And as far as what uh, using Western methods, I, yeah, tribes have had to enact their own court systems. They have to, they've enacted um, various laws to help further development, but not necessarily with a capitalist mindset, more so as a collective communal, how can we take care of our community? How can we take care of our people? But most importantly, how can we continue to be stewards of the land and, and everything within those ecosystems? That's such a powerful question. And I, I just to speak from the perspective of various just transition movements in Appalachia that we're connected with, I think many people feel like this is a time of reckoning for those movements 
and uh, for for both scholars and activists, because the 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 the, the there's been a lack of attention. I mean, I, I have to say this last Appalachian Studies meeting was the first time that there was a land recognition as a formal part of the ceremony. But of course, that's common practice um, out west. And um, the 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 on one hand, there is this sort of cultural commons in the region in a very informal way, almost a guerrilla way where people are doing this kind of commoning approach to the land um, and have the uh, different, you know, Northern European settlers and, and other folks um, have this deep attachment to the land and are commoning in a way that doesn't fit the, the sort of usual bound to the framework of thinking about private property. But there has never been an adequate um, engagement with the, uh, the, the, the fact that there was such a radical displacement of indigenous peoples from the land. And so there, there's a hope on the part of many people that, that there can be more conversation with um, groups that are, have been displaced away from the central Appalachia. Um, and the, the recently um, there was the, there's been several workshops on the land back movement um, the possibility that some of the, the land in central Appalachia could be returned to, to the tribes. And I think there's a lot of interest in, in that as a key part of, of the land reform. The, but because of the collapse of the coal industry, it means that there are vast tracts of land now that are essentially um, being held by bankrupt companies that are only, their only assets are their claims on the stock market that they've got, they own land in Appalachia. And so it's a, pot, it's, it's a time when the whole nation could come together and come up with very different models for how that land could be owned. And, and, and it could include, um, or the hope is there can be some land trusts and land commons and um, just a mosaic of different notions of what it is to relate to the land as stewards, not as owners. But this is all very, this is in the area of dreams and hopes. There are just a few land trusts. Thank, thank you both. Tony, does your organization grant directly to tribes? We grant directly to tribes, CDFIs, educational institutions, which can be a public school or a university. Uh, and we also uh, fund nonprofits. And like I said, a fiscal sponsor can be utilized. So if you want to be a fiscal sponsor for a tribal project or a, a group that you know that would be interested in, when I say Native American farming and ranching, it's very broad. We also, in, we also fund within that realm. Um, we don't give it a hard definition, but the broad definition includes um, food gathering uh, and traditional uh, hunting, fishing practices, the uh, reclamation and protection of, of traditional food systems. So um, think broadly, it's also about educating so that funding can be used for scholarships. For our, our CDFIs, we uh, have been getting more and more applications from CDFIs and they're not just for the native CDFIs. Um, any CDFI that's going to fund Native American farming and ranching can get funded from us. But again, we are going to exist for another 18 years and we have, um, we, we anticipate annual cycles in of at least 10 million. Thank you. That was really helpful. I have a question for Ms. Howell. Uh, thanks for, for presenting. Um, my question is, what, what efforts are being made uh, to kind of like prevent the, the, that like separation of the, I forgot what you called it, like the mixed titling or the title 
whatever I forgot what you said, but like it's how public can we, airs property is the same thing. You, right, it's just our local. <laughs> yeah. So like what what efforts are made to are being made in kind of Philadelphia or other urban environments to prevent that from um from ha having people like lose their homes because someone shared uh, an article in the uh, previous session where that's happening in New York and it's just like out of, it, it can easily get out of control. There are a few different things. Um, so right now we just got a new register of wills, which is a big deal for Philadelphia because we had the same one for 45 years. And um, the new register of wills is, is really hyper focused on this issue. Um, she's been doing a lot of kind of public education campaigns, frankly, to get people to to create wills and recognizing the importance of, of doing it. Because I think that a lot of people have the sense that, you know, they're in the home and they're undisturbed. And so it's not an issue. And it, it's not an issue until it's an issue, right? And so I think public education is one of the big things that they're engaged with. Um, speaking to the fact that it's unaffordable for a lot of households to, to go through pro probate because poverty is, is an issue for a lot of these households. Um, one of the things that they're, an initiative that's new for that department is um, basically deferring probate fees. And so that fee, instead of you having to come up with $400 for one generation of, of transferring, because like every estate, so if you're, if you're three generations in, you've got to come up with $1,200 worth of probate fees and you've got to come up with inheritance tax through those um, generations. But they're basically rolling those fees into um, sort of a lien on the property. So it doesn't actually become due unless you sell the property. Um, so there's basically programs like that where the city is, is looking to make sure that folks can stay in their homes. But in addition to that, um, there's a task force that's been um, set up to look at deed theft, um, to really go after um, unscrupulous purchasers who are kind of going in and claiming to be the owner and selling a property out from under householders. And so that's something that's happening a lot. All right, awesome. Thanks for the rolling conversation. I hate to cut that off, but we do need to officially start the second iteration of this. And I see some faces that were with us, um, you know, an hour ago. That's awesome. And we also got some new faces on. So thanks, Alexa and Brett and everybody for <laughs> reminding me that we actually need to start this formally. Okay, so I just want to uh, briefly introduce the panel members that we have in this session, which is heirs property across race and place. Okay, so we with us we have Olivia um, Howell, who's with she's just speaking. Uh, she's with the Pew Research Center's Philadelphia uh, Research and Policy Initiative. And then there's Dr. Betsy Taylor, who's with the Livelihood Knowledge Exchange Network, or LICAN, in Lexington, Kentucky. And then we have Tony Strangler, I'm sorry, Strangler McLaughlin, who's uh, the Regional Director of the Native American Agriculture Fund. And so just based on our experience from last hour, I would ask the panelists to really just try to make um, your most salient points and maybe you know trim off a little bit from your presentations because I think the exchange that we have is really what makes these sessions richer. So with that, I'm going to ask, um, gosh, uh, I'll ask you, Octavia, just to go. All right, um, starting my timer. <laughs> so thank you, Cassandra. Um, as she mentioned, I work for um, Hughes Philadelphia Research and Policy Initiative. We focus on Philadelphia and issues facing um, the city. And lately, we have been focused on housing and heirs properties um, is one of the things under that portfolio. In Philly, we call heirs properties tangled titles, um, just because it's really difficult to untangle who the owner is on, on these properties. And it's just our, our, our local term. And it's hard for me to practice saying heirs property. So you hear me saying tangled titles throughout. Um, so our efforts to explore the issue um, began with um, trying to quantify how many folks were dealing with the issue. Um, we've known that this is an issue in Philadelphia um, kind of broadly, but the numbers to, to really quantify how many people were dealing with it were kind of stale. Um, we find that um, like in other places, the main way that people end up in a tangled title is if they're passing down a property without that will. And so you have a household where a person is believing themselves to be the own homeowner and, and perhaps without any dispute and living in that home, operating as if they are the homeowner, but their name's not on the deed. Um, 
And for in Philadelphia, that's a big issue because we've had a long history of high home ownership among middle and low income households in the city and also among black re residents. And so in the plenary, we learned from Professor Mitchell that um, that black households are much less likely to have a will. Um, the second way that you could end up in a single title or the second most common way in Philadelphia is a failed rent to own agreement. So a person's trying to purchase a house, doesn't have access to the mortgage market, and that deal um, either doesn't go through or it, or it, they, they complete the process, but the, the seller either disappears or didn't have um, title to the property in the first place to create to enter into a rent to own agreement. That we can't quantify, um, but we can quantify those um, properties that have been passed down. And so we estimated um, that about 10,000 properties in Philadelphia are dealing with that issue. The way we got the number was to look at the city's administrative data sets to compare the names on the deeds to, the, to death records and really just see whether or not um, all of the owners whose name is on that property um, are deceased. And um, we're fortunate to really have comprehensive data um, at the parcel level, which you know, was mentioned this morning that doesn't exist in a lot of places. Um, one of the things I wanted to highlight is that in Philadelphia, we're not talking about a um, situation where you have the opportunity to subdivide a lot. We're talking about a thousand square foot property, often a row house attached to other housing. So subdivision is not an option. Um, it's really um, figuring out who's going to have access um, to the property. So where are the properties located? Um, a, a map has been pulled up to kind of show um, tangled titles in Philadelphia. You've got a map of Philly. Um, the larger blue dots are showing where the greatest prevalence of tangled titles are within the city. And um, it, it would have been good for me to show you a map of, of race and race or even income in Philadelphia. And what you see is that it, it overlays pretty, pretty neatly with the places where you see the largest dots. The tiny dots, you know, there are tangled titles clearly through almost in every census tract within the city. Um, but it's mostly concentrated in North Philadelphia and West Philadelphia, um, areas that have long term been um, occupied by, by Black households and, and also there has been the opportunity for home ownership to occur there. Um, one, a lot of households don't recognize and, and we said it that they have a tangled title issue. Um, it's most frequently discovered in the city when a homeowner is applying for support. So we've got, in, in those places, like I said, poverty is, is a big issue in, for a lot of households that continue to live in those parts of the city. Um, so they need supports like help with um, adaptive modification. If a, a senior is aging and not able to go up and down the steep stairs in a Philly row house, or um, having a furnace repaired or a roof fixed. Um, and when they apply for those programs, they're denied because you're using federal or city dollars that really want to make sure that investment is not lost by you taking advantage of them selling the property. And so if it's a tangled title, they're rejected from those programs. We already know that you can't get a loan for home repair, you can't refinance a property to, to do cash out for a renovation, and you also can't tap um, any equity that you have in your house for something like higher education or to, to, to deal with a, a debt issue or any other reason a person might tap into their household wealth. Um, and so these properties um, often fall into disrepair. Uh, when we spoke with the city's um, code enforcement office, we learned that many of these properties, if you look at an aerial view of Philadelphia and zoom in, you can see that many of these properties have holes um, in their roof that are visible from aerial photography. Um, and a striking anecdote that we learned was that the lion's share of collapses that have happened in the city. So in Philadelphia, we've had a few um, really tragic cases where a building has has fallen down and it has often it has sometimes resulted in a, lo a loss of life, a loss of property, a loss of um, cohesiveness in the neighborhood. But that has happened typically in properties that were tangled titles. That's almost almost all of those properties. So um, you may have noticed in the table that's kind of next to the map that I um, sent there that that's um, showing there that property values. Um, so if you look at the, the very top bar, North Philadelphia is where you have the largest number of tangled titles in Philadelphia, um, represent about 4% of all, all units. And those are just the ones we were able to detect, right? Um, property values there are $40,000 um, or the median for those tangled titles um, properties are worth $40,000, uh, which is much less than um, really any other area in the city and certainly far less than a place like Center City, um, Philadelphia. 
And so we're finding that this is where people are, you know, have been able to have these legacy homes that provides um, a source of affordable housing, even though there are quality concerns. This is a, a place where people are able to, to kind of hold on to home ownership. Um, but the neighborhoods are changing. Um, we, we talked earlier about the idea of gentrification where, you know, there is development pressure um, and, and sometimes some unscrupulous um, folks who come in and recognize that there's no one's paying attention to um, the, the deed and, and will kind of steal deeds and, and, and sell properties in places where there's a lot of de development pressure going on. And so as there, there is an opportunity for those who are living in an area that's developing and they have a tangled title to kind of tap into some of that wealth to clear things out. But there's also a real threat um, for property loss. And so those are some of the things that we're, we're interested in and paying attention to um, in Philadelphia. Awesome, thanks so much, Octavia. And I asked Alexa to actually throw up two slides that I did where I mapped Ears property. And I intersected this with um, percent African American. And this is just a sort of my little tiny effort to support what you just said. You, you mapped uh, Ears property in Philly, but you didn't intersect it with race. I just wanna show these two maps. These are maps, the one on the left is from, um, uh, Macon, Bibb County, Georgia, and the, the dots are Ayers parcels, and uh, the layer underneath is proportion African American, and the darker areas show higher proportions of African American. So you can see that intersection between uh, the con how, how Ayers parcels in this one county in Georgia are highly correlated with uh, percent African American. And then on the right, that's um, a map of Jefferson County, Kentucky, and that's where Louisville, Kentucky is. And if you look at that, um, that northwest corner up there, that's where Louisville is. Louisville is a highly segregated city, and you have a lot of African Americans in that northwest sector of Louisville, and you have a huge concentration of heirs parcels in that part of the city. So I just want to sort of reinforce what you were saying, Octavia, about that correlation um, that intersection between percent African American and these and where these properties are. Thanks so much. All right, awesome job. Thanks so much. Okay, so uh, Betsy, you're up. Can you unmute? You're muted. Can you hear me? Um, yeah, so uh, uh, Brad, we, we don't need to, to have that PowerPoint, uh, Alexa. I'll just talk so I can get through quickly. Okay, yeah, thank you so much. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so um, I wish that I had some of these great maps that Cassandra was just sharing. Um, but uh, we don't really know the incidence of heirs property in central Appalachia. Um, I'm going to be talking about the historic coal mining counties in uh, the mountainous parts of Ohio, West Virginia, Virginia, um, Kentucky, and Tennessee. And it's an area that seems to have a lot of heirs property, um, and, and that crosses uh, different racial communities. Um, and what's really important in understanding the land situation in Appalachia is that um, starting in the beginning of the 19th century and then inten intensifying over the next hundred years, vast tracts of land were bought up by absentee land companies. And um, so you had a stab by the end of the 19th century, you had this deep inequality in land ownership. And then when coal came in, um, the coal companies that are producing the, the wealth from coal are largely leasing from um, the, the different, um, from the land companies. So you have a lot of layers of, of ownership that makes for a very complicated situation. Um, okay, and so you have this paradoxical situation where you have basically feudal land ownership um, in, in terms of who holds titles and if, if and, and the smaller residents often have very insecure titles and are, and are continuously losing those, 
their access to land because of the, the usual practices of land speculators and using heirs' property as a way of getting access to it. Um, but you ha also have these very densely populated coal camps attracting tens of thousands of people from, um, from Alabama, skilled coal miners coming up from Birmingham, um, migrants coming in from uh, s Southern Europe, Eastern Europe. So it's, it's a sort of wonderful uh, mix um, of people who are terribly housing insecure. The coal companies are uh, holding uh, the, the, the right to, to, to houses over their heads as part of the controlling the labor force. Um, and in response, people creatively created in many ways a sort of almost like guerrilla land regime um, f wandering off into the mountains, into the corporate owned land, into public lands, and doing basically forest commoning, carrying on traditional practices of wild crap crafting and, and foraging. Um, and, and along with that was developed a kind of passionate attachment to the land, which has been very important factor in social movements, even to the present. Um, and I, I just wanted to do a shout out to one of my coworkers at, at Lycan, who um, um, comes from uh, many generations of coal mining family in Southern West Virginia. Um, Ruby Daniels is our community engagement coordinator. And um, she um, has carried on the tradition she learned from her grandmother and on, uh, she like many people in the area because of the economic um, booms and busts, went off and worked in other places, um, in Baltimore and other places, but she, the, the heirs property land, small piece of land that her uh, family had, was one where she, uh, she uh, has now started a new business uh, as a herbal business, um, a thriving business, um, using these Afro-Latin traditions. Um, and uh, so, the the you, in this situation, um, we we really only began to understand the extent of this was very much not studied. We only began to understand the extent of this inequality in the late 1970s after massive floods, um, when the Highlander Center in Eastern Tennessee, uh, a, a very amazing community organizing center, convened meetings that led to a really large. Um, participatory study of land ownership with teams of citizen scientists going into courthouses and documenting ownership. And from this, this was the first time we began to get a picture of the fact that uh, three quarters of the, of the surface land is, is owned by outside owners and 80% of the mineral rights. And along with that goes um, a really um, a very unequal tax situation because of the, the extent of the, the power of the, the, the companies. Um, so I, the, the, in this situation where you already have this tremendous inequality, um, the fact that much of the um, private land owned by local people is in heirs property is, is really very salient. Um, and, I, I wanted to point out that as people are mobilizing for a just transition to a more equitable economy, um, one of the areas where people so, sort of have the stereotype that heirs property is a, is a, is a rural thing. It's, it has to do with the family farm or the, the beloved home place, but it's also becoming a big factor in um, uh, like in efforts to, to revitalize Main Street, these little uh, towns, which can become the hub for um, a, a new kind of uh, planning. Um, and then the other thing is it's, it's related in ways that are not clear yet to problems in coal permitting because the, of the reality of split estate where mineral rights can be split off from surface ownership. And we're still, uh, we're really trying to build up our understanding of that. But um, there's an active um, movement for land reform. The Alliance for Appalachia is a hub for that uh, with, with many grassroots environmental justice groups. And the, there's a new uh, effort to, to 
um, update the Appalachian Land Study, a group that you can find at um, AppalachianLandStudy.org. Um, and finally, um, there, there are many dreams about the possibility for a kind of new mosaic of multiple kinds of land ownership, which can include land trusts and, and areas of forest commoning, which, in, which are working landscapes. Um, because if, if we really are going to build asset-based development, building on the assets that are already there, um, the, 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 the passion for the land and the, the traditions of forest stewardship um, in the area and this extraordinary mixed mesophytic forest um, provi could provide the basis for a, a really, um, for a, a new and regenerative kind of economy in central Appalachia and, and possibly help to clean up the terrible legacy costs of the coal industry. So I'm going to stop there. Awesome. And I was under time, Cassandra. <laughs> this time. <laughs> we should be compensated for last. Time. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Awesome. Thank you, Betsy. All right. Uh, Tony, you're up. Okay. I'm going to shorten my time by a few minutes. So, Till Hostesquinshut and Sutitqua. Hello, my name is Water Runs Downhill, and my English name is Tony Stanger, and I come from the Colville Confederated Tribes in Eastern Washington State. And today I'm representing the Native American Agriculture Fund, which is a philanthropic drawdown trust, and we provide funding to Native American farmers and ranchers, and we supply that funding through the nonprofits, tribal governments, educational institutions, and and tribal governments. So those are our four uh, entities that can apply for our funding. We give out funding right now on an annual fiscal cycle. We just finished our 2020 funding and we gave out $15 million. And as of uh, yesterday, we are um, starting to move forward and planning our 2021. So if you would like to apply for our funding, please visit our website. But back to our main point of discussion, and that is land loss and fractionization and what that looks like in Indian country. And when I say Indian country, I'm talking about the tribes that exist, the people who inhabited this continent, um, this land before anybody else, the indigenous, the Aboriginal people of the United States. And we are called, um, every tribe has their own name. So when I say Colville, that's the name of a man who never even came to America. He owned a fort. But my people are the Nahamchin people, and oftentimes our names are related to a geographical uh, boundary or, or, or something related to the land. So for me, we are the people of the water. We have always inhabited the Columbia River from Canada all the way to California. Um, but today, when we talk about Indians or Native Americans, we, I will use the term Native American or Indian as it relates to these communities and these people who are all although uniquely here in the same, are unique in that each one of our tribes have their own creation story of how we came to be and where we exist. As I said in our last session um, that I'm gonna echo earlier in this session is our attachments to the land uh, are, are very strong. Whether we were removed from the East Coast and moved to the West, the, the story of who we are as a people are gonna go back to the land that we originally come from and where our ancestors have, are, are still um, laying the ground, our, our, our spiritual beings exist. And for instance, they're often, our creation stories are attached to the land, they're attached to, to the, the food that exists in that region, in my region, um, salmon being one of those. Uh, but we're not gonna leave our land, unlike other communities where we have the most super fun sites in, located uh, in, in, our, in, in our backyards across any, uh, you, the whole United States, most of those are located in, in Indian country. Um, but we're still not gonna leave because this land is so important to us and, and because part of our creation story is we will forever take care of this land. Now, some of the issues that we deal with that seem historical or not, we are still dealing with them today and, and my generation, my kids will still deal with these. Some of the issues that have been remedied through Congress for other minority groups cannot be fixed through Congress for tribal groups because as it stands right now and, and likely into the future, we will never own our land. The federal government holds our land in trust. 
tribal governments have collectively the authority to oversee the use of that land, but the federal government um, holds the title to that land. And also Native American individuals have their own land and some of their land can still be in trust, but that trust is, is through the, their tribal governments or through the federal government. So again, never having access to full legal title of that land, you have the right to use that land and pass that land down, but you can't use it for, for other beneficial uses that, that our first speaker was talking about, such as the equity or the value of the land or using that land for collateral. You, um, there's been some progress in the last couple of farm bills and other legislation to help tribes be able to utilize their land, but right now that's, that's what we deal with. And why, how did we get here? Through various acts of Congress in different time periods where either the federal government was trying to get rid of the Native American in the fact that they wanted to make them farmers, they wanted to, them to become civilized, become citizen, citizens, to lose their attachments to their tribal and traditional communities uh, so that their excess or, or um, surplus land could then be bought out by uh, colonizers or homesteaders. But the most drastic uh, destructive policy towards Native Americans was the Allotment Act, and that's when individuals were given the right to have a certain allotment of land, a certain patch of land and that and they were to farm that land and the federal government would hold that in trust for them for 25 years and after that then it would be taxable um, but the related to the allotment act was the the uh, the burke act which would let people would give them the right to their land earlier in exchange if they were farming so then they could become citizens and vote. So between the Burke Act and the Allotment Act, 90 million acres were lost for tribes. And today we have reservations that are smaller than an acre. And we also have reservations, the largest being the Navajo Nation, which is 16 million acres and encompasses four different states. Uh, but again, the federal government holds that land in trust. So some of the most more recent federal acts that have been um, put in place to help tribes with the land fractionalization and airship issues um, were done so in 1983 and, and upwards of last year, we've had some legislation passed to help assist tribes in being able to use their land. Uh, but the Land Consolidation Act uh, was done with great intents and purposes, so was the American Indian Probate Reform Act, but for, as I discussed in our last session, many tribes have uh, belief systems that don't allow you to talk about death, and therefore you can't talk about wills. And so uh, for some tribes, it even like my, my husband's Navajo and he's an attorney, uh, two of his cousins are attorneys, but when his grandmother was passing, despite having free access to attorneys, it was an uphill battle to get a will put in place. And oftentimes in any country when you are, even if you have a will, the Anytime you're going through probate, it could take very long, but when you're talking about working through multiple jurisdictions within tribes, then it could take up to two years. So those are some of the issues, but also when, when tribes do have access to their land, oftentimes because they can't utilize it the same way that a non-native can, for, for farm, I'm gonna give the example of farming and ranching, then, then they lease it out. And so that the majority of those dollars that are derived from that land are going to non-natives. They're not staying within the community. Uh, the Indian Land Tenure Foundation has been doing wonderful work for many years to try to help tribes in, this, in these issues, but they give an example of on the Pine Ridge Reservation, $33 million goes out to non-native farmers, uh, and that value is derived from the one of the poorest counties in the United States on the Oglala Reservation in Pine Ridge, um, South Dakota. But the other example I have is I was doing work in Idaho on the Nez Perce Reservation and in one county, I was looking at some of our ag statistics and for all the farmers that registered that they made over 100,000 that year, only one identified as Native American. That's not to say that we should get rid of all non-Native farmers and ranchers because it, oftentimes it's a great partnership. 
uh, tribes have to be able to justify their water use and they do that oftentimes through leases where for agriculture um, but also uh, for Native Americans it, they can't utilize some of the farm service USDA loan programs because the three ways that you mainly enter and get a farm number don't parlay into Indian lives because we don't, if you're operating wholly within your tribal land, on trust land, you don't file, oftentimes you don't file taxes. They don't do land evaluations to also identify for a farm number. Um, and, and you don't have a deed, you don't have ownership of that land, but there has been within the administration, but also through the budget government, especially in the farm bill, there's been ways that they've tried to remedy these issues. And, and one being uh, a majority share document that you can get from the Department of Interior from the Bureau of Indian Affairs to say that even though you have a hundred other family members that have access to this small parcel of land, you've gotten the ma majority of them to sign off to say that you have the authority to enter that into a certain farm program, our disaster assistance program. And, uh, our, one of our speakers earlier in the plenary was talking about how you can do, um, you can go to force people to go to court regardless of the amount of interest you have within that property. You can't do that in Indian country. Even if a majority of the people that own that land want to go to court to sell it, you can't because we don't own it. The federal government owns it on our behalf. At convoluting the issue even more. But again, recent acts have tried to remedy that, these issues to allow tribes to be able to ha have a, a clear avenue for not only participating in agriculture, but participating in value from their land. So there's been some creativity done in some of the farm service loan programs where you can collateralize the the value of what you're producing as opposed to collateralizing your land. Um, but it's a work in progress and there's a lot that we can continue to do and sessions like this and, and the, the whole um, presentation today, learning from what other communities are doing are really important. And I'm just gonna close by saying for Indian country, uh, we're not gonna leave our land. It is intertwined with who we are as beings, as, as humans. Uh, and so even though what might look like uh, success in another community, as far as being able to utilize your land for economic value, that, that doesn't mean value in Indian country. For us, it's, all, uh, it's very communal based and to have value in that land could mean that it lays idle. Uh, for traditional gathering purposes. But for Indian country, we are, are in the ruralest of rural America, the poorest of poor America. And here we are, still, we still exist. We still have our tri tribes, our reservations, our traditions and our culture, and we've survived through all of this and will continue to survive and thrive. And I wanna um, finish with an example in this work that Betsy's doing that ties, ties both of our, our discussions together. And that the Navajo Nation for many, many years has been plagued with coal issues and the destructive nature of corporate entities that go into these reservation communities. And then they file bankruptcy and they leave and then there's all this environmental harm left there and the tribe has to deal with it. But for the first time ever, a tribe has stepped in and said, we are gonna be the new owners of this, the coal um, lease and we are going to determine what our energy future is gonna look like. And so the Navajo, Navajo Transitional Energy Company NTech was um, started almost eight years ago and they are they are a transitional company because eventually they don't know if they'll have coal but in the meantime it's one of the main provider of jobs within their community and also they uh, have become an example across the entire coal industry because they they put people before profits. And they immediately upon becoming owners of the property outlined all the environmental improvements that they would make and all the requirements that they would make of those that buy into 
that buy their coal that they would require of them. And uh, they ended up buying other coal companies because they've proven that you can do people over profit and still have a successful business that employs people and uses this in the mo in, in the best manner that you can. And in the meantime, they get to diversify their energy into other avenues. They've tried to, they're engaging in solar and wind um, and they're doing planned communities that will, instead of worrying about big transition lines, they're gonna do these planned communities and do smaller scale energy projects. But they're an example. And one of the issues that um, Betsy brought up in our last discussion was, how these coal companies have access to the land still but for the navajo the big thing that they have access to is water rights and so for for an end tech to be able to come in and and have access to that but to be able to give it back to the people to be able to let the the navajo tribe collectively decide what they're going to do with those water rights and with that excess land um, is very important for them to have the ownership of them of that and it's it, it is so significant. It's not talked about often because coal is a bad word. I mean, I live here in the Columbia and, and my people survive on um, salmon. And so um, for my husband is, is involved in NTEC, but we do, we um, work collectively as a partnership involved in NTEC because it's, it's taking back the land. It's dry. It's because getting off of the sidelines. It's getting off the bench. It's getting, you know, out there in the field or on the court and being able to make your own dis decisions. But it's also getting involved into the industry where we could pick it. We could go to court. We could file claims. We could with the with the federal government, and we have done that for hundreds of years and it hasn't worked. And now we're stepping into the driver's seat and saying we're going to change it. And now coal, the coal industry is saying, hey. Maybe we'll do that too. All right, thank you. Thank you, Tony. Let's open it up for some questions. If you have a question, please unmute your mic and pose your question. There are a couple in the chat box, but I want to help let people use their voices. I, I'd just like to follow up on what Tony's saying. And the, having a national conversation about these issues is so vital. And I think it's very important in terms of thinking about what environmental justice is to recognize that the rest of the country owes a, a, an energy debt in many ways to areas that have given so much in terms of the raw energy in the past that the wealth of this country has been built from that kind of extraction and those kinds of land grabs um, and much as we want to get off of coal um, it, it, it this is not just a regional issue this is not just a problem for say the coal communities or the oil communities to solve it, it all, all the people whose current wealth uh, across this country is is based on that th those webs of extraction of indigenous land and, and other resources um, are implicated. Um, I, I had a quick question for uh, Octavia or Cassandra um, dealing with more of the, the urban issues. Um, so I'm in Charleston, South Carolina. Obviously, this is an issue here. Um, is there anything that you can do at or effect change at like a municipal level or does it all kind of have to come down from the state dealing with like the legal statutes that are involved in the way that the laws are kind of set up at that higher level? Um, or is there anything that the state can do to or the city, excuse me, can do to kind of incentivize change? Here in Philly, one of the um, and, it, and it's a very, very new initiative is um, we have a, a brand new register of wills and she has been trying to see how we can address this at, at a local level. Um, one of the challenges for clearing heirs properties is that that $400 um, transfer fee or the, or the probate fee is what I should um, call it. Um, one of the things that they're doing is really taking that fee and folding it into um, the property as a lien that is um, that they don't recover unless you sell the property. Um, and that enables folks to, to kind of get out and, and, and transfer properties where there's that fear of, of moving forward. Another thing that they're doing is really, um, they're, they're, they're on a listening tour and, and a speaking tour to talk to folks about the importance of, um, of transferring title 
when there has been a death. Um, we have been doing the work to identify where Tango titles are in the city and they're really interested in working with us to find out what parts of the city to kind of to tangle on, a, on a, I mean, not to tangle, but to target on a more granular lever, level with that type of kind of information campaign. Now, I would definitely defer to the attorneys who may be on the panel because I, I'm, I'm not sure. I, you know, it, you know, this this issue is essentially one of a lack of estate planning. So it seems to me that that's sort of the root of trying to get at avoiding being in this situation in the first place. Cassandra, uh, the the center I, I uh, notice has a few attorneys on the line, and not to call them out, but uh, hope. <laughs> Would you maybe like to? Uh, 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 address uh, Kip's question, you know, since, since we are here in Charleston and, and obviously uh, at the center, we are working with this day in and day out with Ayers property. Can you hear me? I don't have my air plug in, but can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Can you um, ask your question again, Mr. Kip? Sure. The The question was just, is there anything that can be done kind of specifically at the municipal level to address this issue, or is it something that kind of needs to be elevated up to um, the state level? As far as heirs property in general? Uh, yeah, specifically in like the, the urban centers where you can kind of see the properties um, concentrated in ways that like subdividing them might not be a, a resolution. Yeah, that's actually not um, a municipal municipal issue. It's a, an inheritance issue. So it's not something that the city alone can address. Those follow the intestacy laws of the state. And, um, and one of the interesting things about this particular breakout session is that those intestacy laws and inheritance laws are different by the regions. So South Carolina's are directed by South Carolina uh, probate laws. Um, the city's involvement, unfortunately, often comes in when a family does want to divide the property into a smaller piece, um, or there is dispute over how to use the property as far as who can live there or who wants to live there or who doesn't, um, who does want to sell. Um, but the, the overall inheritance laws is directed by the state. The use laws is something that the city can sometimes impact, but that's going to be um, location by location. I was wondering if you'd seen any interesting, you know, because the city, obviously the inheritance laws are dealt with at the state, but the city would oversee kind of the taxation of the property and that interaction with the property if you'd seen any kind of interesting incentives through through taxation or um, anything like that to maybe like bring about this issue to discover properties that would have um you know the the heirs property issued or the tangled titles and maybe bring those to the surface so at least they could be dealt with rather than kind of sitting dormant or or unknown in the sense that the city can't force somebody to do something even if they because some of the incentives that are already there are what we call primary residency exemptions and homestead exemptions and i don't know if anyone has um mentioned those two things already um but those two exemptions specifically uh, you know encourage people to use them as a way to reduce their taxes, which is something that often prompts people to come to us because an older family member may have been living on the property and getting those two exemptions and the taxes were really low. But then once that person passed away and their estate was not addressed, then that reduced tax went away and the taxes skyrocketed again. And that happens regardless of the size of the property, regardless of whether it's in a city or if it's in a rural area. Um, the only exemption to that is if it's under agricultural use. That doesn't necessarily go away just because the um, primary resident passed away. But so those two things already exist, but it's still up to the family to activate the legal action 
to change the ownership stats. So unless the family does that, there's, there's nothing the city can do to them. The city can't come in and do it themselves. I wanted to add on a little bit to um, what's happening here in Philadelphia, um, just to point out that where where the city is waiving the probate probate fees, they're not really waiving it. They are they can only defer it because the state has that jurisdiction, and so they can um, they they're what they can do was limited, and they've been kind of creative in finding ways to make it um, easier for households to do with it. And I think that the fees that are associated with transferring the title that the city is responsible for, they have been able to waive. But um, as Hope said, I think getting people to to actually engage and, and get those wills and transfer the property, that's something that um, you know you can't force, you can only you know really focus on 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 sharing why it's important and having um, the incentives within whatever whatever existing programs are there. Octavia, could I jump in just as a colleague of Octavia's? Hello. Garrett. <laughs> just on that, in addition to the register of wills uh, deferring the fee, that the, the Department of Records has also agreed to waive the fee for recording a title, uh, entangled title cases, and some of the city programs that uh, for an like owner occupied payment agreement, if you're behind on your taxes, or uh, the water department has one if you're behind on your water fees. Uh, even to get into those programs, you have to be the homeowner, but they have uh, means now to to work with you if you're if you're trying to clear a title to give you I think you have like a three year period where you can be in the program and still not have clear ownership of the property. Uh, but those those liens you can you can get into those programs for homeowners now even if you're not. So th those are some of the things the city can do to make it you know e either to incentivize uh, people to or make it easier to clear a title or to make the the, the clearance problem like less of an emergency um, if, if they are having tax or uh, utility lien problems. Awesome. Thank you so much. I actually have to run to class now, but um, thank you guys. Uh, very fascinating presentation. Thank you. So we have so we have just one minute before we're we're due to um to end the, the session formally. So um floor is open. If not, maybe uh Alexa, did you want to read one of the questions from the chat? You're on mute. Sure, let me see. Um, from Brenda Gilmore, Gilmer, has joint tenancy with right of service survivorship been tried as a workaround, not speaking of death? So I'm assuming that's for Tony. You can, there are some ways that you can leave trust land to heirs, but the issue is the heir has to also be enrolled as a tribal member within that tribe in order to retain the land as trust. Um, and, and it's not that trust land versus fee simple land is, is necessarily bad. There's, there's good and bad to both fee simple and trust land. But when tribes are trying to keep their land in trust, um, the right of survivorship isn't utilized like it would be outside of a reservation community. But for instance, my grandfather was an enrolled tribal member, but his wife is not my grandmother, but she still is residing on the land. It's, it, it's still in trust until, her, until she passes um, the way that they set that up in their will. Um, but also I wanted to say that for, for tribes, um, it's, it's just more, it's, it's more complex. There's multiple jurisdictional levels to owning land, but you can have allotment. I saw another question in here about allotted land. There are people who have had allotments that they received in, in the 1800s and their families held on to this entire time, but they pay taxes on it. It's in fee simple now. Uh, but there are other allotments that are held in trust and the N is non-taxable. Uh, there's, again, benefits to either face simple or um, 
having to pay taxes on as to not paying taxes on it. But the main issue also for tribes is the hold on to their sovereignty, their authority over their land. And the more allotments they have, the more fee simple land they have that's not uh, owned by the tribe or individual tribal members, it opens up their property and they learn, they lose their jurisdiction over um, civil, civil and criminal issues on within the confines of the reservation. So that's another reason why tribes are looking to hold on to their land and keep it collectively grouped uh, uh, right now. Wow, that's really interesting. So it sounds like in some kind of a strange or ironic way, there's these incentives for um, land being held remaining, um, you know, as, as these allotted uh, uh, parcels. You know, one may be avoidance of taxes and the other is kind of um, not com coming under the jurisdiction of the, the broader society rather than being, you know, under the auspices of the tribal law. That's really interesting. All right, so I think we're just like two minutes over. Brett, um, I'll hand it back over to you to let us know what comes next. And thanks so much, everybody. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you, Octavia, Betsy, Tony. This has been awesome. And thank you to everybody who showed up and asked questions. Thank you. And thank you, Cassandra. A yeah, great session. Thanks for putting um, us together in a group. Thank you, Cassandra. Thank you, Betsy. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Octavia. Uh, Thank you to everyone that uh, attended the session and, and stayed on from the last one. Um, as, as all the panelists said, we've had great discussion today and, and I think they really made the, the point today that Ayers property is just not a, a, an is issue here in Charleston or in the Southern uh, states, but, but all over the nation, but it you know maybe calls something different in other places, but it affects more than one group of people, I think is, is what the takeaway is today. And, and I think this is a, a great, uh, has been a great opportunity to, for everyone to learn more, but also how we can all work together to, to help additional people. Um, so I want to thank everybody for attending today. And it looks like Alexa just posted a link. Uh, so our last session of the day is at six o'clock. And that is uh, the special event that we are having with Chuck Lavelle. Uh, if you were in the plenary, uh, you may have heard Janet mentioned that uh, Chuck Lavelle is a, a forester. Um, he also produces a show, America's Horse with Chuck Lavelle. Uh, the, the Center for Air's Property Preservation was, was uh, last year filmed. Um, so we'll be showing this particular episode that shows uh, or highlights some of our landowners that participate in our sustainable forestry program. Um, and then also, so you'll hear from Chuck after we show the, the video. Uh, you'll also hear from uh, our, our board chair, Yvonne Knight Carter, who also is in the film. Uh, so you'll get to, to learn more about her experiences and her family and, and them utilizing their, their land for uh, generational wealth. Awesome. Thank you. So do we go back to the plenary for that or is so there a link? Um, Alexa just posted uh, the link in the Action. chat. Uh, also, if everyone has a copy of the the agenda, uh, that link is also in the the agenda in that particular section. Awesome, thank you. So thank thank you all so much. All right, have a great evening, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.